when a monsoon isn't a monsoon. Monsoon as a word is taken to mean wet conditions, but there's actually two halves to every monsoonal climate, a dry season and a wet season. Scientists warn of a 1.5 degree global warming breach. After the first time it happens, it's going to happen again and again with increasing frequency. And another peek inside the Met Office archive. This beautiful instrument is often described as a crystal ball, and that's a pretty good way to imagine it. It's Friday the 13th of May, and you're listening to Weathersnap from the Met Office. Hello, I'm Claire Nazir, and this is Weathersnap, the insider's guide to the week's weather headlines. Last month, we reported on the early onset of an intense heatwave affecting India and Pakistan. We are now in mid-May and the situation remains critical. Here with the latest, Nick Silkstone of the Met Office Global Guidance Unit. This latest spell of uh, very hot days with maximums greater than 47.5 degrees C began on the 7th of May. And uh, we've seen maximas at two locations up to 48.0 degrees. Uh, this is uh, Jakababad and Sibi that are both in central southern Pakistan. That is an impressive heat. It really is. And, you know, it's easy to say people can cope with that heat, but that is not far off the highest temperature ever recorded in the world, which is, you know, in, in the mid 50s. Why does India get such oppressive heat at this time of year? As the boreal spring starts and the sun starts to move northwards across the northern hemisphere, the subsolar point, basically where the sun's directly above you, progresses northwards as well. At the current time, that sat across basically central um, northern India, certainly at midday local, and it basically is able to bake the ground. Also across India, we've had the northeast or the dry phase of the monsoon, which has been in progress since last autumn. And that means that the ground is quite dry, hard, and basically receptive to heating up quickly. All that's in place and uh, this time of year is always hot across northern India and Pakistan. They regularly reach the uh, the low 40s, but this year just some other dynamics have allowed that to increase uh, somewhat further. And as I say, this current spell, their maximums are generally five to seven degrees above what you would expect for this time of year. So when you talk about the monsoon, you're talking about wind patterns here. So we always associate monsoons with heavy rain and that's certainly a dominant part of this um, seasonal variation across India and the subcontinent but can you just in a nutshell explain that again how the monsoon is really about wind direction? I can so a monsoonal climate uh, by definition it basically has two seasons that are very contrasting with a sharp delineation between them generally a dry season uh, in the case of India and Pakistan it's the northeast monsoon when the winds are coming across you know the high Himalayas so they're dry and then that reverses uh, during May and June when the south westerly monsoon which brings moisture laden air from the Indian Ocean across the region and that continues then through to around about September October time so yeah monsoon as a word is taken to mean wet conditions but there's actually two halves to every monsoonal climate a dry season and a wet season. Another question, obviously, is has La Nina, which is prominent at the moment, influenced this current wave? Depending how far you go back, there's contrasting studies that suggest different things. But overall, there is some theories that believe the large scale circulation during La Nina, particularly during the, uh, say, the, the spring months, is more supportive of large scale patterns, which allow subsidence um, in the atmosphere across parts of northern India and Pakistan. And that substance effectively puts a lid and prevents basically convection, you know, the breaking out of showers and thunderstorms, which allow temperatures to cool somewhat. So that subsidence, which they believe may be slightly more increased during La Nina episodes at this time of year, could be helping uh, just push those temperatures that little bit more exceptionally higher. When will it all end? When will that heat slowly subside? It, it doesn't really end as such as far as we can see. Um, it's going to be some more hot days where we may get, you know, 49, virtually on 50 degrees in those, again, prone parts of, sort of central southern Pakistan on Friday and Saturday. And then there's a subtle easing through Sunday, Monday and the early part of next week where temperatures will drop closer to average. However, the signal is the second half of next week, temperatures will trend up again. And once again, we'll be looking at, you know, approaching the high 40s, perhaps the odd spot dipping into the low 50s of degrees Celsius. And that basically continues quite similarly for the next sort of 10 to 15 days. Nick Silkstone, thank you very much.
Every year, the Met Office produces an outlook about the Earth's climate for the next five years. Following the release of the latest report, Graham Madge spoke to lead author Dr Leon Hermanson, who explained some of the key findings. The headline results are that we have a 50-50 chance of temporarily exceeding one and a half degrees above pre-industrial in one of the next five years. This doesn't mean that the 1.5 degrees of the Paris Accord has been broken. It's just a temporary exceedance. I think that it's very likely that one of the next five years will be the hottest recorded. We've also looked at the next five years as an average, and we find that the average temperature, the global temperature over the next five years is going to be warmer than the five years that have just passed. With the potential for one of the next five years to record a temperature above 1.5 degrees Celsius, is the goal of limiting temperature rise to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels still realistic? A single year exceeding 1.5 degrees is not in any way meaning that we have reached this threshold of the Paris Agreement. It just means that we're getting close and you know, after the first time it happens, it's going to happen again and again with increasing frequency as we get closer to the 1.5 degrees threshold. The notion of 1.5 degrees of warming is based on a global average. But in reality, different parts of the globe are warming at different rates. There is a pattern to climate warming, which we see in our forecasts quite clearly. We see more warming of the land than of the ocean. We see very clearly that the Arctic is warming faster than the tropics. And in our report, we point out that in the next five years, the anomalies are going to be three times larger in the Arctic compared to the global mean. So we're seeing accelerated warming in the Arctic region. In global terms, the UK sits relatively close to the Arctic. So, should we care about what happens there? The UK is very sensitive to something we call the jet stream, which is a, some very strong winds high up in the atmosphere which cross the Atlantic and it brings with it storms or if it moves away it can bring some very cold weather in winter. So the weather is very dependent on what the jet stream does. So the Arctic is part of what controls exactly where the jet stream goes. So even though it seems like you know, lots of warming in the Arctic, maybe that's not going to impact us because the jet stream is sensitive to the um, temperature gradient between the tropics and the Arctic. Warming the Arctic fast will reduce the temperature gradient, it means that we might see changes in the jets and therefore we might see changes in the weather here in the UK. For non-scientists, a 1.5 degree change in most things wouldn't appear particularly significant. But when it comes to climate, that figure means a lot. We have this global mean number and you now people focus on this global mean number. It's a great and easy thing to look at, but things are a lot more complex than that. And what a lot of people may not realise is that a small increase in the global mean temperatures can mean a big increase in a region somewhere and you know, a big increase in flooding for some people or uh, heat waves. And so my worry is that you know, people are saying, well, what's it matter if we you know, 1.2, 1.3 or 1.5? But what we have to think about is every small increase in global mean temperature can you know, locally bring in very big changes and quite disruptive events, which can cost billions in the economy. While this year's update highlights some worrying trends, there are a few areas for optimism, even if localised. There is good news in the report as well, definitely. One of them is for Western Africa, the area we call the Sahel. And it looks like the next five years on average are going to be wet, which is good news for farmers in the Sahel who depend on these seasonal rains coming every year. And I think that is the most positive thing we have in the report. Dr Leon Hermanson talking to climate correspondent Graham Madge. Well, higher temperatures are set to be a feature of the weather over the next few days. Alex Deacon can tell us more. Warmer weather is on the way for the UK this weekend. It's going to be quite humid as well. And warm doesn't necessarily mean sunny either. There will be plenty of sunshine on Saturday, but by Sunday, there is the threat of some heavy and thundery showers. Good news if you're after some rain across the south. 
OK, so let's put some detail on. High pressure is moving in and showers are possible across northern Scotland on Saturday. But apart from that, most places set fair. It'll be a chilly start with temperatures down into single figures, but generally a fine day on Saturday with lengthy spells of sunshine. The sunshine, though, will start to turn hazy across southern England come the afternoon. And that's when we're looking further south down to France, where thundery showers are likely to break out on Saturday and they may well drift northwards. Before they arrive, though, temperatures across the UK and the sunny spells up into the high teens, low 20s, 23, 24 is possible across the southeast, maybe even 25 for the first time this year. The thundery showers, though, across France may well drift northwards during Saturday evening. So the risk of thundery showers across southern England spreading into parts of the Midlands and Wales overnight Saturday into Sunday. As I said, good news if you're after some rain. The bad news is they will be hit and miss, not everywhere seeing those downpours. And that leads to uncertainty about Sunday, just where we see these thundery showers. Certainly across England and Wales, there is the risk of these downpours. But again, they will be hit and miss, not everywhere seeing them. With the warm and humid air drifting north, bringing the thundery showers, if we see some sunshine, well, that could really set the temperatures to jump even higher. Again, 24, 25 likely where we see some sunshine during Sunday afternoon, but perhaps a bit cooler on the east coast. Warmer conditions likely to continue into next week with a continued likelihood of some showers in places as well. Thanks, Alex. Each week on WeatherSnap, we include a short summary of the week's observations records, including sunniest place in the UK. But how do we know which location received the most sunlight? As part of our occasional series, Exploring Objects in the National Meteorological Archive, this week we hear about a device that does just that. Here's senior archivist, Dr Catherine Ross. Campbell Stokes Sunshine Recorder, 1943. The Campbell Stokes Sunshine Recorder was invented by John Francis Campbell in 1853 and modified in 1879 by Sir George Gabriel Stokes. This beautiful instrument is often described as a crystal ball and that's a pretty good way to imagine it. The recorder consists of a solid flawless sphere of glass about 15 centimetres in diameter set in a heavy brass mount. When in use at an observing station, the recorder is typically mounted on a concrete pillar. The mount has several slots in it, which are used to hold paper cards. When the sun is shining, it is focused through the glass sphere in such a way that it burns a hole in the card. As the sun passes across the sky, it shines through different parts of the sphere, burning a different part of the card. This gives an indication of how much sunshine has occurred throughout the day. The system is simple but extremely effective. Three different shapes of card allow for differences in the height of the sun and the length of the day during the year and turning the card around allows the instrument to operate in both the northern or southern hemispheres. Campbell Stoke sunshine recorders are still in use at weather observing stations across the world and have the added benefit of requiring no electricity to operate them. Dr. Catherine Ross. You can see pictures of the Campbell Stokes Sunshine Recorder, together with other notable weather related objects, by visiting the National Meteorological Archive and Library web pages at metoffice.gov.uk forward slash research. Just before we go, Martin Bowles has last week's highs and lows. Here are the UK weather extremes recorded between Monday the 2nd of May and Sunday the 8th of May. The highest temperature of the week was 23.6 degrees Celsius at Faversham in Kent on Friday. That's officially the hottest day of the year so far. The lowest temperature was minus 1.7 degrees at Alpnahara in the far north of mainland Scotland early on Saturday morning. The largest daily rainfall was 41.0 mm at Aknagart Ross and Cromarty in northwest Scotland. The longest daily sunshine was also recorded in northern Scotland though further east on the Moray Firth coast. 13.9 hours was recorded at Kinloss Army Barracks on Saturday. Thanks, Martin. That's it for WeatherSnap. I'm Claire Nazir and editor is Adrian Holloway. WeatherSnap is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office weather app.